Good morning. Happy Halloween. You ready to take a journey with two serial killers? Yes? All right. Uh, this is two cases of very extraordinary, similar cases of two British ser serial killers. Um, in two different locations in England, very different locations, with two very different outcomes. Uh, and we're going to explore those, those processes here in a little bit. Uh, the first of the first case will be the uh, footpath murders in Leicestershire County in England, specifically the three villages uh, just south and west of Leicester, the, the primary city in Leicestershire. Um, and then the second case will be the one that most of you are familiar with uh, to some level, the Ripper murders in London, England. Um, so we're going to look at each of these cases, uh, starting with the footpath murders. We'll go to the Ripper murders, then come back to conclude with the uh, footpath murders. So I hope you enjoy and, and learn a little bit about serial killers overall, and specifically these two particular ones. Okay, the focus of my presentation is going to be on two aspects of crime in general, but specifically serial killers. Uh, the first aspect is modus operandi, which commonly, you guys commonly refer to as method of operation or MO, if you watch a lot of TV drama crime series. So I'll say MO, that basically means modus operandi, which is a Latin term for method of operation. Uh, what that means basically is the action that a person, the offender, the perpetrator, takes to perpetrate their crime. Uh, and they do so with the idea of concealing the crime and even looking at ways to evade capture. So those are the three aspects, the action, the steps taken by the killer, the ways of not being detected, and then trying to get out of the situation and evade capture. Also, we're going to talk about, respectively to these two serial killers in Britain, uh, what we call signatures, or sometimes referred to as their calling card. Uh, the calling card is basically going beyond that MO, how they normally do their crime. It goes beyond that, and that's their signature that distinguishes them from other serial killers, for example. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on. And then the second aspect of serial killers that we're going to look at is the victimology. Um, basically what that means is, are, is the characteristics of the criminal. In this case, the characteristic, or excuse me, ex characteristics of the victim, sorry. Uh, so we're going to look at all the different victims, uh, what they had in common to link them to a particular person that may have committed these crimes. Uh, so those are the two aspects of the serial killer that we're going to look at throughout the presentation. Also, I want to emphasize the process of justice in England. It's a little bit different, even though we, our roots are in England. Uh, it's a little bit different as far as the process and what it's, what's needed to have levels of proof at each, each level. Uh, from the investigation stage to the court process all the way through corrections. So we'll look at those things as well. Uh, I'm also going to take you on a virtual walking tour of both serial killers. Uh, different locations that they traveled uh, and some of the reasons and look at different locations where they tried to conceal and evade capture by what they did. Okay, The first area of England we're going to go to is Leicestershire, England. It's important to know a little bit about the geography of where these, these incidents are taking place to give you a good idea of the MO of the killer. 
So we're going to go in. Everybody kind of knows where England's at, right? So we're going to go in from here. It's, it's in the uh, Atlantic Ocean, English Channel that separates Europe. We're going to go into Okay, this is the county of Leicestershire. It's in the geographical center of England, and just to the east of that county of Leicestershire is the county of Rutland. Uh, I say that, and it's not on here, the reason I say that is the Leicestershire police police this county and the county of, of uh, Rutland. And that, if you look at the laser, pointer here, Rutland's kind of just following that track is right there. It's a smaller county. There's only two cities in there. It's mostly rural. Okay. The Leicestershire police police that area. Okay. All right. The largest city in Leicestershire, of course, is Leicester. And that's right in the, the middle of the county. Two important aspects about Leicester that we'll see later is first the University of Leicester. That will play an important part later on. And the county seat, or excuse me, the counties where the headquarters of the Leicestershire Police is in Inderbury. Enderby, right there, Enderby. Okay, so kind of give you an idea of the proximity of Leicester, the largest city, about 300,000 people, and we're going to, to the 1980s now. So things are gonna be a little bit different than this current map, and I'll explain some of the things as we go along. All right, here we go into the most important areas as far as these particular murders. There are three villages that we're going to look at. One is Enderby. Okay, and this is this village right here. And it's just, it just wraps around here north of the village of Narborough. And then we have the village of Littlethorpe. Those play an important part in the whole story, the whole case of the footpath murders. Now, on average, the Leicestershire County, on average, has one, about one murder every year. They investigate, on average, one murder every year. Not very many, okay? The three villages combined in that county have never, have never had a murder in the history of those three villages. And the, their history goes back to the invasion uh, William the Conqueror, 1066. So there, there's evidence that these villages existed thousands, thousand years ago, a little over thousand years. Okay, so keep that in mind. Never had a, a murder inquiry. I wouldn't say a murder because their murders probably didn't go reported. They never had a murder inquiry or investigation in those three villages in their history. So this is a pretty unique case already. All right, we're going to go a little further in. Okay, Forest Road, which is right, right here. It wraps around here and goes back to a major highway called King Edward Avenue. Okay, up here, there used to be a psychiatric hospital called Carlton Hayes Hospital. In 1936, it changed from that to that name from the Leicestershire and Rutland Lunatic Asylum, okay? So that will tell you a lot about what kind of hospital this was. It was a psychiatric hospital right where you see this area right in here, okay? There are two footpaths where our murders are gonna occur. One is right here, and I'll get to it, I'll just follow my line, it starts right here, and goes all the way down across King Edward Avenue 
to a church right here. This is a graveyard. Okay? The other one is right here, starting right here, goes up like this, cuts across here, and then goes back towards Enderby and actually merges into an actual road. Okay? You guys remember that? Okay. All right. So let's talk about this particular um, case real quick, and then we'll move on to the Ripper cases. All right. Until November 22nd, 1983, there hadn't been a, a murder inquiry in those three villages combined. On November 22nd, at 7.20 in the morning, this is the footpath that I first described from Forest Road. A bod the body of a 15-year-old named Linda Mann was found by a, actually a, the one of the hospital workers that used that footpath to get to work. She had been raped and strangled to death. Okay? She was last seen about 7.30 the previous night. And she didn't come home. She didn't come home until, or until her, she never came home actually. So uh, she was last seen at 7.30 and then the parents waited for her and she never came home. So that's when they called the police. This particular location was unlit, very narrow path. On one side of it is the psychiatric farmland, pasture land. On the other side of the crime scene is construction of a new housing development. Okay? So it's kind of remote at this time. Very cold night. You can imagine in the darkness walking. If you were to walk on this with no light, just had the moon very cold and you had these very sinister looking iron wrought iron bars pointing toward the, the the path and a psychiatric hospital in the background so that kind of gives you the idea what kind of scene this was so as soon as the uh, body was discovered and the police re and re the police responded they immediately called the pathologist who is, is, our, is our version of the medical examiner coroner. Um, and then tons of officers, of course, were there investigating the scene. Um, Linda, the body was naked, half from the waist down. Um, there weren't a lot of injuries. There was seminal fluid in the uh, vaginal area. Um, no nose blood, blood in the nose and rigor mortis which is a stiffening of the body had already taken place because of the weather uh, she had a jacket that was pulled up under her head and bottom of her feet were really dirty and looked like that she'd been dragged through the farmland from from this footpath there's a gate up on the on the head of the footpath where she looked like she was dragged into that area and the crime was committed um, so two things happened as far as the the um, investigation to start off one of course with any murder investigation we do house to house inquiries and that's what they did in this case as well it's, it's common practice to do um, questioning of people um, throughout the area to see if they heard anything see anything or just that they seen her it's a small village so a lot of people knew each other and also a team of investigators to look at the hospital because there were 10,000 records of people going back five years that they had to go through uh, from sexual offenders to those that were um, referred to them by the court for day treatment they weren't all residential so we had outpatients and residents um, so there was a lot of work to do, and they did it right away. The pathologist got there, did his thing, and then when the crime scene investigation was done, the body was taken to 
uh, where they do the post-mortem exam. And the results were pretty interesting. Of course, we already know that she died of strangulation, um, manual strangulation. The biggest clue to this point was that the blood type of the person was a group A secretor. And only one in 10 of the males in England have that particular blood type that they looked at. So, and that's the only way at the time they can distinguish between people was blood type. So we could have hundreds, thousands of people that could have, admitted, that could have committed this crime. Okay? All right. Real quick, go back to the scene. Okay, here is where the body was found. In this area right here, that it, there is an actual housing development there currently, was being built. Okay? And the body was found right here. So, so they started doing house, house to house inquiries. And there was thousands of, of witness statements, uh, thousands of follow-ups on leads. Uh, 150 people in the next few months had been, their blood had been taken. Um, and there were several that had this particular blood type, but they also had a process by which to eliminate. Okay, there was an indecency list, number one. That was composed of people that committed rape in the last five years those that can, what they called indecent assaults, which we would call sexual assault, and then those that did uh, indecency type offenses that were considered nuisances, like flashing, exposed themselves, things like that. So they try to connect those three things to the house to house list and to those that visited the hospital for treatment, therapy. So there was a lot of, a lot of things to do, a lot of people to talk to. All right, months went by, years went by. In fact, a little over two years went by until the next murder. Um, there were the, the murder squad went from 150 officers down to two by the summer. So the case went cold. Life in Narborough went back to normal somewhat. Um, girls were told not to walk on footpaths, obviously. Uh, so everything kind of just, well, we'll search for the killer things come up, we'll still investigate, but we're down to two investigators are on this case. So it's kind of bleak, uh, still, still hope. Meanwhile, in the University of Leicester, a geneticist named Dr. Alec Jeffries was developing a process to extract DNA from human cells uh, that were in blood, saliva, semen, etc. Uh, and in 1985, he published the results, and the police department was fully aware of what he was doing. Uh, it just was very new, and they're used to the traditional way of doing policing, contacting witnesses, looking for evidence, and, and, and arresting people that way, good old-fashioned police work. So this was pretty new, so they kind of just let it be known and it was out there. Um, the process was pretty simple, after, I mean, once you learn about it and know about it, but again, it's pretty complicated when it comes to a layman like any of us. So, except for maybe Vicki or something. It's Vicki's doctor. <laughs> All right. Then, while this was going on, things were getting back to normal. We had another murder. Okay, this was on the other footpath that I showed you on the map. Another 15-year-old girl named 
Don Ashworth, Athworth, Ashworth sorry, was discovered on 10 pound lane, uh, off, often called Green Lane because of its lush growth of vegetation and dense undergrowth. So a lot of people walk their dogs in here. Now on this particular incident occurred during the day and it was there in the summer. But if you look back on the um, on the map here, there's a major highway right here and then a major motorway, six lanes that goes this way and pasture land on each side of where the incident occurred. And if I'll go up a little bit here, I'll give you an actual look at this way. Okay. Right here is the entrance from this King Edward Highway, goes into 10 pound lane, curves back towards what was the psychiatric hospital, and then goes back towards Enderby, then comes back towards Mill Lane, which is a road that turns into 10 pound lane. Right here is a footpath that goes across the M1 motorway. The body was discovered right in here. So we, this at the time was pasture land. We had the highway, and then we had pasture land here from the hospital. So if anybody tried to scream, uh, it was pretty remote, they couldn't hear anybody. And, that, and that's probably what the case was. Because in, in this particular case, there was more injury to the genitalia area, the anus, the vagina, and the perineum, all had severe damage and also appeared to be some bruising and scratches on the body. Some of it was a result of being dragged to where the body was found between the highway and the, the actual crime scene. Okay, so you can see the proximity of the second murder to the first murder, which is right here. That's not very far. That's only a few hundred feet. Okay? So, the MO. Both had been raped and strangled. That was the MO. Both were on footpaths. Okay? Both were 15 year old girls. There's where we have the the action to commit the crime, and now we get into a signature aspect, going beyond what it took to commit that crime of murder, okay? Raping the young girls, um, using that footpath, concealing the body, an escape route. They were, he was able to easily get in and out of those footpaths without being seen, okay? They're very remote. All right, so what happened that within a few days of this murder, there was this young man named Richard Buckland, 17 years old, that was hanging around the crime scene of Don Ashworth's, uh, the location of Don Ashworth's uh, murder. He had knowledge, he was telling people, friends, that he had knowledge and was pretty accurate on what the body looked like, what the crime scene looked like. Uh, he was talking to officers on the perimeter saying, hey, you need to look at this particular area. You need to look closer to the motorway, to the footpath over the bridge. He was giving a lot of detail about something that hasn't been in the media yet. So the police thought this was very interesting. Now in England, it takes a little bit of less level of proof to arrest somebody. In our country, you need what we call um, probable cause. You have the reasonable belief that that person committed that crime and no one else. In England, you can just have a suspicion that they were involved in that crime and they can make an arrest, okay? So that's what, exactly what they did. Five o'clock in the morning, they went and arrested Mr. Buckland. Okay. And there were witnesses that saw a person that fit in his description driving a motorcycle, uh, described what he drives at these different locations. 
So he was arrested, interrogated, and within one hour, or excuse me, 15 hours, he confessed to murdering and raping Don Ashworth. Okay? Here's the kicker. He did not confess to murdering Linda Mann, the first murder victim on the other footpath. Okay? And a blood test was done on him, and he wasn't a group A secretor. But they still detained him because they had something on him. He knew something or a co-conspirator in this, in this particular murder and or the other murder as well. So he was held for four months during the investigation. Once they charged him with the murder, he was held for four months, court process. And then just before, just before that four months was up, they decide, hey, we're going to use... Alex Jeffries, Dr. Alex Jeffries' new invention of genetic fingerprinting and test it out. So they took the two samples, seminal samples from the two victims and the blood test or the blood from Richard Buckland and went to Dr. Jeffries with it. Okay? Dr. Jeffries tested with this new technique and guess what? DNA didn't match his DNA. But the DNA in both samples were still the same person. So there was just one person who committed the rape and possibly co committed the murders. Okay? Now, in both postmortems, it was it was concluded that both victims were, were raped at or after the time that they were strangled to death. Okay? So, that's what we have to work with. So, as soon as this was discovered, the police were, were whoa, they couldn't believe it, that this was, this was their guy, and he, they knew he had something to do with this and the other one. But that pretty much solidified that he wasn't the guy. He was still maybe a conspirator or knew something about it because he knew something about the crime scene. But they released him. They dismissed the charge of murder against Dan Don Ashworth. So we're back to square one. Okay? So here's what happened next, which was another revolutionary thing that happened in the, in the police world. What we call the bloody. Okay? It was a voluntary blood testing of all males in the three villages. It started off with just particular males, age 13 to 34. Why that age? It was arbitrarily selected. Why do you think they, they did that? Could have been, but as far as scientific proof, scientific reason. Anybody know? Can think of it? Okay. Okay, let me tell you. The semen count was very high in the in the sample of of semen from each of the victims. Okay. And that, so that age group probably has the highest uh, semen count. So that's why they arbitrarily selected that number. But they went further and said, decided all males can voluntarily come and, and do the testing. And they had a pretty good turnout. 98% of all the residences and males that they, that they did the house-to-house -house inquiry and some of the hospital outpatients and ones that are released that were resident, 98% came forward. Okay? All the ones that had the group A secretor blood type were tested with Alex Jeffries and independently independently tested with the home office which is who is oversees police functions in, in England they did an independent test at their laboratories so there were people that had that particular blood type 10 percent roughly that went to do that testing now you can imagine thousands and end up being over 5,000 blood tests. Can you imagine how long that took? And it did. It took a long time. They could never get through 
in a, in a year's time, let's say, all those. So this was the world's first, what I call the first DNA dragnet, okay? Now keep this in mind. We're gonna, we're gonna stop here with this particular case and we're gonna go to the second case, which we're all familiar with, and that's the Jack the Ripper murder cases, okay? Um, I had the opportunity in May to go with a group to London, England, and we had a chief superintendent, retired chief superintendent named Glenn Jones give us a tour of the different locations for Jack the Ripper. Um, now, we're gonna go to the map, so if you're not familiar with London, we're gonna go and zoom in here. Okay, see that? Okay, look, this area right here, that's Greater London, okay? That's policed by the Metropolitan Police Service. Over 33,000 officers, big area. If we, if we go in a little bit, you see this little red appearing? That's the actual city of London. It's, it's about one square mile. Okay? That little area right there. To the left of this is what was referred to as the East End of London at the time. It's the Whitechapel District. This was considered to be the worst slum rookery, not only in London, but in the world. Uh, the poverty was extreme. The death rate was high. Children didn't live past five on average. Raw sewage was poured out the windows. Raw sewage went down the streets. Uh, Prostitution was extremely endemic in that area. Um, it was estimated by the Metropolitan Police Service that there were over 1,200 prostitutes in this one square mile of Whitechapel District, okay? That's the ones they, they knew about. There were part-time ones uh, because they couldn't make enough money in the other areas of work that were in that part of the, part of the, uh, the city. Down here at the bottom is St. Catherine Docks. At the time in 1888, which is the White Chapel area, we're talking about 1888, a lot of immigration uh, from Europe, especially Polish immigrants, Polish Jews, uh, people from Ireland, just a lot of different people coming to this small area and cramming in with the residents that are already there where the poverty already was pretty bad, and it made it worse with, when the population got over, over abundant. All right, so this particular area is kind of unique, and it, it, a lot of it's still the way it was 1888. It, if you go there, it looks like they dropped three and four story buildings wherever they could. Like they just let them go and drop them into open space, and it just got so packed with structures that it created narrow roadways, narrow alleyways, narrow passageways. Can you see where an MO is gonna start here? Signature, okay? And at night, you couldn't see anything. The fog from the Thames River was so thick, and then add that the smoke from all the residences crammed into the, the areas, into the buildings, was just overwhelming, and all that was lighting the area up were gas lamps in various locations. So you couldn't see anything. A perfect place to commit a murder, okay? Here's some pictures that I have that will give you an idea of the area at the time in 1888. This is Dorset Street, one of the worst streets in London. It was in the parish of the Spitalfields uh, it was so impoverished that it made the rest of Whitechapel look, look like heaven. Uh, it was so bad. You can get an idea of all the people standing out here. This is an example of what a building, and this is pretty original right here. You can see that all the different 
types of buildings. They were just thrown in there like when they were constructed. Then you can see down here, jagged alleyways, just no right there. Well, that's actually me. Na a narrow roadway with some, with some buildings. And this is what they call um, Artillery Lane, one of the narrowest streets. Wasn't really a street, you just walk down the middle and, and there were buildings that close. You can actually jump one side to the next. So there, that's how things were. They were and curvy. Uh, it was just un, unreal. And then every once in a while, you could duck into an alley. And there would be a yard, an alleyway, a passageway of some sort. It's, it was just very unusual. So that, that was Whitechapel at the time in 1888. Now, it was very common for, or for the police to find dead prostitutes. I mean, it wasn't uncommon for see someone, a prostitute murdered or found a natural death or had a domestic argument. Murder was, was, and death of prostitutes was common. There was a lot of disease. They had a lot of diseases. They gave a lot of diseases, okay? So it was uncommon, or excuse me, it was common. What was uncommon was to find prostitutes dead with their cut, with cut throats, abdominal mutilation, and complete evisceration of their organs. Okay, that was uncommon. So in 1888, and here's some other pictures of the, here's a common lodging house where, where women, mostly prostitutes, would stay for four pence, eight pence, depending on how many beds they want. Uh, this is a bar that Jack the Ripper was known to go through, even though he was unidentified. Uh, he was known to frequent this bar because a lot of the murders occurred in this area. Again, another narrow passageway. In fact, I was walking through this, which is artillery, artillery, artillery lane, and my group, without, me, without my knowledge, ducked down this alleyway, and I lost them. So it's so easy to get away and, and avoid capture in this type of environment. This is a, the Church Christ, a church, Christ Church in the Spit of Fields, right next to this public house or a pub, uh, where prostitutes you know, frequented this area, but they weren't allowed to stay on this side of, of the pub because it was next to the church. So they had this sign put up, commit no nuisance. Basically, prostitutes can hang around, do their thing, right side of the church. All right. So, like I said, it was uncommon to have prostitutes dead in this manner. From the months of April 1888 to February 1891, 11 murders occurred with those particular types of uh, injuries and criminal behavior uh, that occurred. It is commonly accepted that five of those murders were attributed to, to Jack the Ripper, the unidentified serial killer, okay? And those were called the Ripper murders. At some point, all 11 of the murders that were considered Whitechapel murders, someone considered it a Jack the Ripper murder, okay? But most experts believe that these five, and we'll go over each one real quick, are, are those five that are attributed to him or her, okay? All right, so we're gonna take a little tour real quick of each of these murders. Now, I included another victim because I believe that this victim was used as an experiment for what we know about Jack the Ripper. It was just like first, because uh, some of the MO is similar to the other ones that we're going to describe. It's kind of like his first way of getting out there and showing what he's got, okay? So her name was Martha Tabron. All these people, these six people that I'm going to describe, were all prostitutes, known prostitutes, and alcoholics. Okay? The autumn of terror has begun in London. I believe this is where Jack the Ripper first started his, his run. August 7th, 1888. Now, the other five occurred on weekends, early morning, late evening, 
early morning. This happened to be that next morning, early morning, from a bank holiday on Monday. So there's a similar MO that, that he did it when they were off of work and there was a holiday involved. So this is outside. That's one of the reasons why they, some people don't include this. Um, and the other reason is that the person was, Martha was stabbed 39 times, okay? And remember I mem mentioned cutthroat, uh, abdominal mutilation, okay? She was stabbed several times in the throat. She wasn't cut there, she was stabbed there, and then stabbed in the chest, in the abdomen, and in the uh, genitalia area. So she was, all those areas were still injured in a way that I think were part of his evolving method of operation, his evolving ritual that he'll, he'll come to, you'll come to know. Okay, this is George Yard Buildings. George Yard, that's what it was called in 1888. It's currently called Gunthorpe uh, Street. See the narrow, this is pretty much the way it looked in 1888. And this is probably the only area that I'll show you that looks pretty much the same. This is looking to the, to the north, to Wentworth Street. Now, you'll see that here in a little bit. And this is looking south to Whitechapel High Street. Okay, and there's a pub, public house, right here on the, on the corner here called the White Heart. And that's our, our Glenn Jones, our chief superintendent retired. That's me. All right. The next case, Mary Ann Nichols found dead on Bucks Row. Today it's called Durward Street. August 31st, 1888, on a Friday. Throat cut, both sides severely cut, severed the arteries there, that's how she died. Abdominal mutilation, deep jagged cuts in the abdomen. Uh, and on each side, one more so than the other, the right side had more uh, mutilation. And then stabbed in the vagina, in the vagina a couple times. Okay. Can you see maybe where Jack the Ripper is progressing? Okay, including some stabbing, but now he's into his MO. His method of operation is cutthroat and abdominal mutilation. And you'll see these in the next four, uh, well, three of the four, because there's a little event that took place. All right, this is the way it looks today on the right. And this is the way it looked back then. Right about right here is the same as where these cars are. She was murdered just outside a gate on, on uh, Bucks Row, right here. Okay. Again, very dark area, close to the docks, um, lots of ways to get out. But it doesn't look anything like it did. Just this building looks about the same. You can see it in the distance right here. That's that same building. Okay? All right, August 31st, and we got September 8th. Again, a Saturday. Annie Chapman, 29 Hanbury Street. Throat cut. Again, just to give you an idea. Here's 29 Hanbury Street. This is a door to the business. This is a door to 17 residences that lived in this building. There's a common lodging house. If you'd walk through this, and it was left open all the time. There was no lock on it. This is where prostitutes were frequenting, doing their thing, okay? They would walk in here and, and take care of business so there's a lot of uh, prostitutes hanging in this area. This is what it looks like today. This is Wilkes and Hanbury Street. This is now a brewery. What you see here is now a brewery. There's nothing that looks like this. If you look in these windows, you'd be actually looking in the backyard where Annie Chapman was killed. Annie Chapman was killed in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street uh, between steps that went down into the yard and a fence as you walk out to the left, okay? Cut throat, just like in the previous case. 
abdominal mutilation. Her intestines were completely taken out and put, in on, the put on the ground over her right shoulder. And part of her stomach was put on the ground above her left shoulder. And a pool of blood right there. Okay? He's progressing. He's, he's starting to get above and beyond what it takes to kill somebody. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Okay? Duckbill's Yard. Uh, just the side of 40 Burner Street, which is now Enrique's Street, uh, is Elizabeth Stride. Now, this is, this is interesting, and it looks to the ritual that Jack the Ripper had. Again, cut her throat. She was found with a cut throat, but that was it. The theory is that he was spooked, and he heard something, and interrupted his ritual. Okay, and here in a little bit I'll explain why it was interrupted. Here's what it looks like. Here's the corner of Burner Street, and here's the same corner going back up where this, see this little wheel, wagon wheel? That's actually an entrance to a courtyard, Dutfield's yard. Elizabeth was found in there with her cut, with a throat cut. That's all there was. That was what killed her. Again, his M.O. was one of the things was to cut her throat. Okay? He immediately left there, if we're assuming that this is the same killer, Jack the Ripper, and went to Mitre Square in the city of London. So we're outside of Whitechapel District, now in the city of London. And it's not very far from um, Duffield's yard. In fact, this murder occurred within an hour of Elizabeth Stride's murder of cutting her throat. Okay. Now here is, you see this little bench? This is actually a monument for Catherine Eddowes, who was the next victim. It's September 30th, same date, within an hour, she was found dead here. On the other side of this is a street, but at the time there were buildings that concealed it was a very dark corner of Mitre Square. Okay? And she was found within here. Here in a little bit, I'm going to actually take you through real quick where that occurred. All right. This is a church where next to Mitre Square called Boltoff Church. This is where all the prostitutes paraded themselves for men. Okay? And then the last one, the worst one, Again, last one, they did was more mutilation, more intestines taken out. There was actually a uterus taken from the scene. Uh, part of their kidney was taken. So, I mean, they took away actual organs. Then on November 9th, 1888, Mary Jane Kelly at Miller's Court, 13 Miller's Court, which is Dorset Street, which no longer exists. Here is White Row. And just beyond this would have been Dorset Street. It was the worst street in, in Spitalfields. And there you see that church that we looked at earlier, just in the distance. And there is where, inside her room, where she was found murdered, throat severely cut, so bad it cut the spine on each side. Extreme mutilation. Every organ was taken out and scattered throughout the, the room. Uh, her breasts were cut off put under her head, one between her feet. Uh, I mean, it was just a mess. And this was the only scene that they actually took photos of, of the, of the, of the six that I, that I mentioned. Totally disfigured, you couldn't tell anything about her. Okay. So that, those are the Jack the Ripper cases, murder scenes, quickly. All right, so let's go back to The footpath murders real quick. This is where it really solved the case in a bar of all places, a pub in England where most of the chit chat and, and gossip happens. This is where it was solved. Okay, the Clarendon in Leicester, in the city of Leicester. On August 1st, 1987, fellow workers from a bakery went into the Clarendon to have lunch. Uh, one of the, the employees named Ian Kelly 
said to the others, just talking about, they were gossiping about this other fellow employee that wasn't there from the bakery. Colin had me take the blood test for him. Okay? So the other workers, especially the manager, a female manager in the group, thought that was really strange, and they, they questioned him about it. He just got up and went to the bar and got another drink. Okay, he tried to avoid it. He, he knew he messed up. So it took her a long time to call the police. She knew the pub owner had a son that was a Bobby, a police officer in, uh, in Leicester. So the pub uh, owner called the Bobby, told him about the situation. They called the Leicester police, the, the, the murder squad, and told them that Colin Pitchfork, who worked at the, at the bakery, uh, said, or Ian Kelly said all this about Colin Pitchfork uh, having him do the blood test for him. Now, how did he do that? You can see how long it took, August 1st to September 18th, to make that call and to find out. By the way, August 1st is one year after the death of Dawn Ashworth, why she was still undiscovered one year later. So the investigator at the time received this call, the information, and looked at the house-to-house -house inquiry they actually did with Colin Pitchfork. He lived in Littlethorpe, the village to the southmost village, lived in, in Littlethorpe. They actually did a house inquiry with him. He was on the indecency list. He was convicted of flashing earlier on in his life in the 19, late 1970s. In fact, he later confessed that he flashed over a thousand girls. Okay? His MO progressed. He evolved where eventually he was assaulting them and when they, they were trapped and he couldn't get away, he would kill them. Okay? So that's how the case was pretty much solved and he was on that house to house inquiry. He was actually upstairs putting down stolen floorboards they stole from a construction site and thought the police were there to nick him for theft. That's how the mind he had. He wasn't worried about the, the killings. He was worried about a theft. So, and also he was unalibied at the time of Linda Mann. Uh, so he was not really a hyper priority because he didn't live in these three villages at the time. He moved there a month after the original murder. And he was, he was unalibied, uh, and he had a baby, his baby son, infant son, when he murdered Linda Mann. He left him in the car, went out and murdered Linda Mann. So all that combined, they put him at a lower priority, even with all those backgrounds he had. So this is where the case was solved. So they went to arrest both Ian Kelly on September 19, 1987. Ian Kelly was arrested uh, for conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. How he committed that crime, that Colin Pitchfork took his passport, went down to a local photo booth, cut out pictures, the little pictures that you get at the photo booths, cut out the, the plastic, put Ian Kelly's picture in there, made it look really good, and went to the blood, the blooding, the testing, as Colin Pitchfork and gave a blood test. He convinced him with 200 pounds and convinced him that he needed him to do it because he, Colin himself was doing it for someone else. That's the story he gave him. He was doing a blooding for someone else that was wanting for, wanted for something, he, and he made up the whole story. Anyway, this idiot did it. Of course, he, he was told it was for something else unrelated. No, he didn't know it was about this particular, these footpath, footpath murders. So he was sentenced to 18 months in prison with a two-year suspension. Basically, he didn't do any time. He just had to be a good boy, and he wouldn't have to go to prison. But Colin Pitchfork, 27, check out the name of the street he lived on. Hay Barn, close, Pitchfork, Little Thorpe. Arrested September 19, 1987, suspicion of murdering Don Ashworth. They still had to you know, talk to him about everything. Um, during, and he immediately confessed to it at the house when they were arresting him at his house. Immediately confessed to it to his wife and everything. Um, 
Then the following Monday, he was charged at the magistrate's court uh, in uh, Leicester with the two murders, two unrelated in in indecent assaults that he confessed to, and a kidnapping and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice involving Ian Kelly. January 22, 1988, he received a double life sentence for the murders, 10-year sentence for each of the rapes, three-year sentence for each indecent assault, and three-year sentence for the conspiracy, conspiracy to commit pervert to courts of justice. All right. The Secretary of the State of the Ministry of Justice set a 30-year life tariff before parole consideration. In other words, the judge at the time didn't give a minimum sentence to Collins Pitt for Therefore, it was up to the, the Secretary of State for the Ministry of Justice to, to put that 30-year life tariff. So, in other words, in 30 years, he was eligible to leave and go out into the community and be back in there. He appealed that decision in May of 2009 in London, and that was reduced to 28 years, where he was eligible to be on parole in 2016. In April 2016, the parole board denied parole because in London, uh, they can, even when he's eligible, they can deny him if there's an issue of risk to the community. Uh, the parole board made a recommendation to the Minister of Justice that he was suitable to transfer, transfer to an open prison. Basically, what an open prison is in England is you serve some time in, in prison and then go out in the community to do a job or whatever obligations you have. So, he's gradually going back into the community. And then June 2016, agreed with the parole board's recommendation. And I haven't heard anything up to that point, but he could be in an open prison here soon, working in the community, a risk. To, now, these things happen, reduced term, because he was doing well. He got an education, and he did these things to get back where he, he wanted to be. So that's where we're at in that, those, that case. And then lastly, guys, before we're done, um, Colin Pitchfork was the last man bloodied, and it was a perfect DNA match. So after 5,000 people being bloodied, he was the last person, and we had a perfect match. He was the first person convicted of mur murder using genetic fingerprinting. And then Richard Buckland, who was the, the other man, was a primary suspect at the time of Don Ashworth. He was the first person exonerated for murder in the world for genetic fingerprinting. Um, so those are the two cases, very similar. MOs are very important when we're linking cases. It's, I mean, any time in this country we have 25 serial killers at any given time, and this helps with those uh, cases that we have the genetic fingerprint. Everybody leaves something behind. Trick or treat.